Fighting more than one boss at a time is a fun idea, but tricky to pull off well. While on one hand, you can produce a lot of flavor in the fight via contrasting personalities and abilities, but having to keep track of multiple opponents can be very bad for us because we usually run the risk of getting bum rushed. For the ground rules of qualifications, I'd like each squad to have at least three minimum members. A tag team constitutes its own list. Speaking of, this is a squad boss list, not a commander one. What do I mean by that? While they both feature a team of bosses, the commander boss has one guy barking orders at a bunch of tiny mooks fighting to the grave. Tag team bosses take turns when they fight you rather than actually taking you on altogether. A squad has that boss battling alongside his platoon, inspiring them to be at their best and having the team feel like an actual cohesive unit. Rewarding bonus gold stars if the squad is made of varied personalities with synchronized abilities. Most of all, if they're foils to the main character's party, that's just extra icing on this harmonious cake. We take it for granted nowadays, but Super Mario RPG really expanded the Mushroom Kingdom and made it feel like a more living and breathing world, at least compared to the rather basic plots and settings of previous titles. This is partly due to the introduction of fun characters that expand Mario's two-dimensional universe. Arguably one of the biggest standout fights occurs when we're on our search for the sixth star piece. To set the scene, our party sets foot inside the barrel volcano when all of a sudden, Gosh, it's a Beetleborgs reference! How do I still know what that is? No, actually, it's the Axum Rangers, a group of multicolored teams with attitude, big axes, and hired by Smithy to hinder us from getting the star piece. And yes, they're walking, talking parodies of the Power Rangers, or Super Sentai, whatever your preference is. Y'all are gonna fight about it in the comments either way. From the colorful getup to the silly poses to the overdramatic speeches. These guys spell subtlety with a Z, and I love it! Heck, they even got their own, oh, not a mecha. Just a plain old axe shaped spaceship. Bummer. Aesthetically, they're a hoot and a half, but how are they as actual bosses? Not too shabby, actually. Each ranger is an eerie counterpart to our own party members and has its own distinct ability and weakness that relates to its suit color. For example, Red is the more balanced of the group, just like Mario. Pink is the healer and only girl, much like Peach. Each is tough to beat on its own, so having them all together is downright difficult. But you can still pick them off one by one. Once each ranger is beaten, they'll try to plow through your defenses with their Mecha Zordon head ripoff. Take that and kablamo! Congrats! So you can put that on your resume that you defeated the Power Rangers! Kinda. So, all in all, this was a very fun brawl. The Axum Rangers stood out hilariously, and seeing a parody of the Power Rangers was a much appreciated novelty. Feels good to know that, while the show ain't perfect, still leaves a lasting impression on pop culture today. However, I still had to dock a few points. The fight is fun, but there really isn't a lot of teamwork between the squad. Considering who they're spoofing, that's a big oof. Also, minor nitpick, it feels like they could have used more buildup. You don't get to face any of them before now, so they literally come out of nowhere and it doesn't really feel all that effective. Still, credit where credit is due. They made a splash with their grand debut and definitely gave us a tussle to remember. It was enough of a splash that they featured in Super Mario Bros. Z. Boss battles in the Toho franchise are generally one-on-one -on -one affairs. I mean, one enemy creating a torrential downpour of bullets is enough. Imagine three. Well, Perfect Cherry Blossom gave us the Prism River Sisters for anyone masochistic enough to want to experience that. In terms of build up or an established dynamic, there's really not much to say here. There are three artificial ghost sisters and they get in your way. That's pretty much it. The only real unique thing about them is that they're modeled after the creator's dead sisters. Ah, oh, Toho. Lollies with a side of f trauma. As you'd expect, the fight consists of them combining their musical and bullet talents to flood the screen with all manner of things. But what makes this fight interesting is that it will change depending on which character you play. 
every one of the protagonists gets a different main sister to fight against. This ends up giving the battle some replay value and is something you don't really see in a whole lot of boss fights. Unfortunately, I can't really place this one any higher since the sisters don't really get super interesting attacks, at least compared to the rest of the game, other than a lot of bullets. Neither do they have any fun personalities to play off of each other, which is a real shame because I think there's a lot of potential here. Like, come on, show us the personalities of the dead sisters and not force us to make guesswork through their clothing. Though, maybe we should just be glad that the fourth sister never got into this whole thing. Imagine fighting four of these things at once. <sighs> just be glad I didn't spend the entire entry complaining about Gilbert. Yeah, the three Trails fans in my audience will get that one. For those not in the know, which is less of you than I thought, the Trails series is one of the largest RPG series around and its lore makes The Witcher look like a high school book report. As mentioned in recurring bosses, plug, there are a lot of times in these games where you repeatedly fight the same boss. I talked a lot about McBurn then, but this time I'll talk about the other one I was considering, the Steel Maiden Aryan Road. People who played Azure last year or prior know how difficult the fight against her is. Super strong attacks and insane HP, she's pretty infamous amongst fans. Well, like with McBurn, you don't need to beat her to continue. So when is the first time you actually have to? Well, three games and 200-ish hours of gameplay later, you finally confront her at the tail end of Chapter 3 of Cold Steel 3. Backstory will take forever, so TLDR, you're on a field trip. Shadow organization starts bombing a port town. Your overpowered swordsman of her principal joins you because she's fight hungry. Anyways, with Aryan Road is her group, the Stall Ritter, a trio of knights that have been causing you plenty of their own trouble, especially the leader Duvali, who you fight half a dozen times up to this point. When you finally reach the four of them on the roof, well, this scene does it best. Duvali, Ines, Enea. You may fight with your strength uninhibited. Yes, my lord! We're about to see a fight unlike any other. The fight begins with three lesser knights using the Radiant Star Formation, giving them all a huge buff right from the get-go. Never mind the Steel Maiden herself can also self-buff and heal. At this point, you need to separate the group and make sure they don't overwhelm you. Each member has unique attacks, gimmicks, and supers that can really hurt if you aren't careful. Especially Aryan Rhoda Duvali, who have their own cinematic S-crafts that can one-shot your characters if you aren't careful. Between the powerful area attacks, buff stats, and unfathomed force, <laughs> You're in for a rough fight. Or you can activate Reen Spirit Unification, spam F Scratch to break all four of them, and then just spam Sarah's Brave Aura to accelerate your turn so they never get a chance to act. You know, fun. Seriously, Cold Steel 3's exploits make Final Fantasy V seem like Lunatic Mode Fire Emblem. Trust me, there were many squad fights I've could have put here from the series. But with the multi-game buildup, the fact that both sides could kill the other quickly, and the reputation amongst fans, I don't think we we're gonna get a better showdown. Well, at least till you fight her again in Cold Steel 4, twice, or heck, even later in Cold Steel 3. Yeah, never mind. Ah, uh, bug fables. A Paper Mario fan's response to Nintendo being in denial that Sticker Star sucks. We were given a tried and true successor that combines all the best aspects of Paper Mario, alongside a story and flair that gave its own firm identity. Kabu is best boy. Hey, hey. Once you beat the game, you get a handful of post-game quests to take care of, one of which is a super boss fight against your association leader, Maki. Being the muscle of his own team, Maki is accompanied by his sister Kina, who is the speed and ailment dealer, as well as Yin, a juvenile moth who is also the team cleric. These three essentially function as a counter team to your own, and fighting them can be really grueling if you don't come prepared. Maki hits like a truck, so he can easily one-shot a teammate with low defense. Kina's attacks can be tricky to time your guard to, and she's not above poisoning or paralyzing your allies either. Yin not only heals and buffs the two, but she can even cure them of any status ailments. A lot of things can happen in this fight depending on who you choose to target first. If you attack Maki, Kina will get agitated. If you take down Yin, Maki will permanently buff himself. If Maki goes down, Kina buffs herself. If Kina goes down before Yin, she gets jealous that Maki didn't buff for her and revise herself. 
Aw, how charmingly obnoxious. And if both Maki and Kino go down, Yin will simply retreat from battle. Sure, there are a lot of ways you can cheese this fight, especially with a fully powered leaf using bubble shield and ice fall, or spamming vice specials to bypass their ridiculous defenses. But not everyone comes to the end game with the same or optimal setup, so this fight can still be ruthless to many players. Admittedly though, it does seem like Maki is the sole highlight of this team. He is the one we meet at the start of the game and has supervised our team on their various expeditions. Kina just kind of hangs around once in a while and Yin isn't even relevant until post game. Had their chemistry been a lot more present before the fight, it would have been much higher on the list. But as it is, it's still a great fight that highlights some legitimate teamwork between bosses in a turn based battle. Oh, Kirby. I don't see anything wrong with this. After the Wunderkinds of Triple Deluxe and Planet Robobot, everyone was excited for the next Kirby game and what it would bring to the forefront. What we got was... fine. Star Allies was fun, but felt bare bones being one of the shortest and easiest Kirby games in recent memory. Well, HAL Labs pulled a Monster Hunter and fixed it by giving us a bunch of free updates, making it go from a standard Kirby game to a giant party of Kirby fan favorites. And don't worry, the lore in this game goes all out too, despite them censoring it a bit in the West. In the game, there are three mage sisters named Francisca, Flamberch, and Zan Partizan that act as secondary antagonists. The fights with them are all right, each of them using a weapon based on their name and a different element. However, when you beat all three and their surrogate father, Highness, dear old dad, sacrifices them and himself to summon his dark god, Void Termina, to attack Kirby. Kirby succeeded in killing God, again, but the three sisters were lost as a result. Or so we thought. The game's final update, Heroes in Another Dimension, is Star Allies' redemption arc, finally giving us a pretty challenging mode that forces you to play every dream friend. At the end of the journey, we find a corrupted Highness whose soul survived Termina's destruction. And when we beat him, the three sisters emerge as they decide to fight you for killing their master once more. This time, they will fight as a cohesive unit, sharing an HP bar. Each of them will use the same weapons and elements from before, but this time, they will combine their attacks to deal even more insane damage. This would be even more dangerous in the Ultimate Choice Arena as you need to dodge their screen covering attacks to take as little damage as possible. It's a fantastic fight that acts as the capstone to the game as beating them gets you the final ending. If you are skilled enough to get at least 100 hearts, you'll be able to save the sisters and get a happy ending. If not, they will perish under the curse that has befallen them. As always with Modern Kirby, it gets way darker than it needs to, but still gives us a fantastic fight with three magical girls whose elemental abilities are a force to be reckoned with. Huh, probably should have put them on one of the elemental boss countdowns. Well, we can write that wrong here. The Praying Mantis, one of the deadliest hunters in the insect world, and an even deadlier mate in the game of love. To us mere men gazing down on this little insect, we do not fear the mantis, but to the minuscule world of the bug, to find yourself face to face with this fine trained assassin is to gaze into the many, many eyes of death and to be forced to welcome it. And lucky you in Hollow Knight, you get to fight three of them! Twice! You can only imagine the joy I feel in my heart right now. These are the Mantis Lores, the three sister leaders of the Mantis Village. We first encounter this ghoulish trio in an optional battle in the village after you kind of bust into the throne room. They accept your challenge and lower the gates, but they're not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in with them. The duo comes in two phases. In phase one, you brawl with one of the lords, and already she's got you on the ropes. She's lightning fast and tosses some really hurdy blade boomerangs. Every so often, she'll straight up try to impale you with her lance. But hey, look at the bright side. She's tame compared to phase two, where you fight both her sisters. <laughs> they mostly work together, dashing into you and tossing boomerangs at you. But the good news is, they mostly attack independently. So you can, in theory, find a way around them with your own combinations. Knock one out, then you just have to finish the other, and woo! Finally, you're in the clear. Once the fight is done, the Mantis Lords respectfully let you go, and you can move through the tribe without fear of getting attacked again. All said and done, 
Those three let you off easy. But hey, you'll never have to worry about them again, right? Right? <laughs> I'm in danger! Oh no, it ain't over. The unholy trio makes a comeback in the God Monster content pack, but this time as the Sisters of Battle. At first, the duo plays out more like the original where one sister tries to knock your block off, but come phase two, all three of them get into the act. And yes, they are faster and deadlier than last time. Fortunately, the strategy is mostly the same as the previous fight. There's just a third one. Once you take in the mount, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to the next rest area. And after all that, you definitely needed it. Outside of the difficulty spike between both brawls, both encounters with the trio have one thing in common. A lot of fun, fast-paced action that'll keep you on your toes every step of the way. It's true what they say. A family that chills together, kills together. Hey, Xenoblade, what have you been up to? Actually, don't tell me. It's still really for trails and Toho lore. I'll just assume it has something to do with the magic sword and call it a day. Yeah, I don't talk about this series too much despite how popular it is nowadays. No beef with it or its fans, just it be long. While Xenoblade 1 has always been a cult classic, we have to thank Xenoblade 2 for bringing the whole series back to the spotlight. Speaking of Xenoblade 2, I don't know why thinking about it gives me urges to use 30 belts, talk about darkness, and have sea salt ice cream. Eh, must be the wind. All right, let's talk the main villains of Xenoblade 2, Torna. Ever since their leader pulled a Sephiroth shish kebab on Rex, these guys have been a terrifying threat to our heroes. While Jin and Malice are the most interesting, there are other members of Torna which act as recurring threats throughout the game. Those would be Akos, Petroka, and Mikhail. While you do fight Jin and Malice a bunch, these three get their own style of headaches. The battles with them tend to be pretty energetic as you fight each of them individually, but things finally come to a head when you fight the three of them together at the end of chapter 6. With no blades to help them and relying on their own wits and skills, they come at you with everything they got. As expected, each of them have certain gimmicks that you need to worry about. Akos will debuff the party and act as the group healer. Petroka is the main damage mage using powerful area attacks to do wide amounts of damage. And finally, Mikai will act as the tank and physical damage user. In terms of team comp, yeah, it's a solid matchup. You also need to be careful about which one you take out as it will determine which buffs and debuffs are on the field. Luckily, like most RPGs, the fight isn't bad if you overgrind by doing a bunch of side activities. Torna's Finest is a great ensemble of recurring enemies that you fought before, but they finally get to go all out against you. If I were to dock any points, it's how we get their final battle in the game when we were finally about to learn about their backstory and motivations, so it makes the fight seem less impactful by comparison. Honestly, if we got one more scuffle later, it would have been way better. Well, glad we get the rematch in challenge mode, even if it is non-canon. In the Trails series, oh wait, sorry, Tales series. <sighs> There's so many RPG bosses on this list, what the heck? One recurring archetype is a team of villains that serve as the enforcers for the big bad. Trust me, this franchise loves its evil doppelgangers. Because this is like the fifth RPG on this list and I don't want to lore dump again, let's just jump right into it. The group that did this villain team shtick the best was easily the God Generals. Each of them has an interesting dynamic with one of the playable characters, ranging from former mentor to alternate self to ex-boyfriend. Oof. You regularly engage in battle against them individually throughout the game, so it's only a matter of time before they face you as a team. Legretta, Arietta, and Largo all show up to impede your progress. Each of them serves a role similar to that of one of your party members. Legretta is the fragile speedster slash white mage, Arietta is the black mage, and Largo is the tank. Legretta is capable of reviving the others. Largo can easily wipe you out, and a single spell from Arietta can easily lead to death. It's difficult, but it's immensely satisfying to pull off. Honestly, the only real problem with them is that you never get the opportunity to have a proper 4v4 with them. Imagine how cool that would have been. Okay, you kinda get that in the bonus dungeon. Kinda. It's with the replicas. And yeah, that feels like it doesn't count. Alright guys, real talk. I'm biased towards a lot of games that a lot of people like. Despite this, I'm not going to pretend that these games don't do anything right. 
and I do want to highlight those moments where it matters. So let's talk about Fire Emblem Engage. So yeah, can't fairly judge this game on my own. Though I know someone who can. Restore us. Emblem of Shamans! Ah! What's going on? Why am I an emblem? Talking about Engage. You want in or no? Ah. Well, you called the right man for the job. Say what one may about Engage. Even I will admit the designs are too glamorous, the writing's rigid, and the free time mechanics a huge step down from the previous games. But aside from the solid battle system, this game did manage to do one thing better than most of the other modern titles. The villains don't completely suck for once. The Four Hounds are some of the better central antagonists the series has had recently. Fun designs, interesting fights, and they have their share of crazy fun moments. Special mention goes to the masochistic Gris, who also doubles as Vale's awkward babysitter. Oh, that's... complicated. Heck, their fights probably would have been on recurring bosses if the game wasn't so recent. And well, <laughs> you know. So why don't we make up for that here? There are two chapters in this game where you face all of the hounds together. One's in chapter 11, where they hunt you down after stealing the emblem rings, and the other in chapter 17, where your army has collected the six remaining rings and is ready to get even. Well, unless you're a DLC pilferer and got up to 13 emblems by this point, but I digress. In this chapter, the presumed mastermind Vale is revealed to be a mere puppet leader of the hounds. They incited her to challenge the heroes within the village that she just burned down. All the while, they resurrected King Hyacinth to be the sixth emblem wielder, which puts his daughters in a bit of emotional turmoil. Yeah, I know. Four hounds, and yet you're fighting six bosses. Mind blown yet? And this fight is amazing. The thicket of flames surrounding the terrain and the solemn falling petals playing throughout the whole fight adds even more to both the atmosphere and challenge. Each hound makes thorough use of their emblems, Marnie using Roy to set the field ablaze, Mavia with Micaiah being the tanky staff support, Zephia with Sigurd's extended movement and anti-cavalry arsenal, and of course, Gris on a teleport frenzy with Celica, allowing him to attack your units anywhere. It is such a chaotic fight in all the right ways, and it's just fun to see how these villains utilize your own strats against you. Another thing that makes engaged bosses stand out is the revival stones that keeps them from being one-shot. Each boss in this chapter has at least one of them, so you're not gonna be able to cheese this chapter with one unit sweeping everything. Take your Lysithia vs Death Knights out of here, because this fight demands that you make the most out of all your units if you were to make it out alive. A lot of character development happens here as well. We get to see Ivy and Hortensia accept that their father is a broken man, and despite his persuasions, they power through to put him to rest. It's refreshing to see Hyacinth actually muster what's left of him to express the love he still has for his daughters. Even Vale's fight came off as more tragic knowing what she's been through. And after the duel, she still tries to help the main characters, at risk of being punished by the hounds. It's a rare moment in these modern tiles when we actually get to see the sympathetic aspect of these brainwashed villains be given proper focus. So that tweet didn't age well. One healthy sapling does not a burning forest heal! The Four Hounds, Vale, and Hyacinth are all great villains. Having them together in this big fight further cements this chapter as the game's finest one. It's quite cathartic when the Hounds eventually just accept that they can't beat the main characters head on anymore and opt for more passive tactics later. Even though this is absolutely not enough to win me back into Engage, especially since the last few chapters contain unhealthy amounts of NARM, that being said, I still love Fire Emblem, and even if my least favorite installments could do something this well, it goes to show the testament of the series, even at its lowest. And hey, at least the failed Xenolock version of the Hounds aren't the same characters, so it's not like they can be ruined by being recruitable post-game. Eat your heart out, Awakening. Ah, it doesn't have decent games I actually like. Big off! <laughs> the Nort Court Kingdom Hearts. Despite the awesome premise, feels really disjointed. Less of a cohesive squad and more of just three bosses in the same arena. Woo. Oh Dio, Live Alive. Mostly commander like. Almost made the list since you don't fight much in Wild West, which is ironic. Howling Aces, Cuphead. Closest we get to a squad fight in this game instead of a tag team questionable parenting aside, Good King Mogglemog from Final Fantasy XIV. Each Moogle has its own name and traits. Neat. Elite Trio, Dream Team. Great fight with versatile teamwork. I just like the Axum Rangers more. It's here at least, so please don't hit me. Playtime is over, Star Fox. 
Star Wolf has been a staple rival team across the Star Fox series. They pose as recurring adversaries who interfere with Fox's missions, whether it's under the payroll of Andros or otherwise. The team is led by Wolf O'Donnell, a space pirate and highly skilled pilot on par with Fox himself. He's pompous, malignant, and will never shut up about Fox's father being dead. I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> he too has his own band of misfits at his beck and call. Leon Pawalski, the sophisticated yet sadistic assassin, Andrew Oikoni, the whiny nephew of Andros, and Pigma Dengar, the ex-Star Fox pilot who turned his back on the team for his own selfish gains. Four pilots, more than enough to hunt down each Star Fox member and cut their flight short. They initially debuted in Star Fox 2, where they only fight you one at a time. It's not until 64 that you face them all at once in a proper squad fight. The fights with them are extremely raw, with few scripted moments. Defeating them boils down to getting them off of your flanks and shooting them on the spot. If you can get one consistently within range, you should be able to knock them out right then and there. Of course, it isn't too difficult to swat them with bombs and charge shots before they could do much of anything either. However, if you don't have your fellow pilots with you, then good luck warding these guys off your back because they're gonna wile you down mercilessly. You know, it's also really annoying that your co-pilots barely even try to fight these guys. What did we hire them for? Their fight gets even more vicious on True Venom. Not only are they more prone to somersaults now, but they will always, always guard against bombs and charge shots. If it's your first time playing, no doubt you're going to die a lot here. It's a really tough fight that will demand your utmost skill and a share of luck to get through. They're really making you work for that true ending. And even after all that, this doesn't mark the end of Star Wolf. They would reappear later in Assault with some noticeable adjustments to the team. Pigma is no longer with them as he's on his own scavenging whatever aparoid feces he comes across, and Andrew is enjoying his time being humiliated as Andros's successor. In their place comes Panther Caroso, a brooding romantic who apparently has got the hots for Crystal. Yeah, uh, get in line, Boyo. Nice to see that the old dogs aren't left forgotten. Makes it even better considering Wolf would make his true debut in Smash not long after. Wait, is he flipping us off? Do I need to censor that? Sure, their fights can be frustrating to some people, and you could argue it's not objectively good design in some areas, but it wasn't horrible, just not what we accustomed ourselves to nowadays. If anything, it just adds all the more to the fun and personality. Even when their fights are recreated in Star Fox 3D and Zero, it still just doesn't measure up to how primal their classic fights are. There's also the Star Fox Command ones, but the less we talk about that, the better. Star Wolf has remained one of the most iconic squad battles in gaming. Between their slimy yet conniving personalities, unparalleled persistence, and vicious battles, they've more than earned their acclaim. I'm Josh Scorcher, and... Ah! Amazon Package just got here, and it's, uh... Can't tell you. It'll ruin the surprise. God. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.